Well, the day has finally come. I've been promising this video for a while actually, but today we're going to be fitting this M50 manifold to the E30 M52 conversion. For those of you who are new, the context of the car is this. It's a BMW E30, a 1990 model, originally a 316i, and I've recently dropped in this M52 B28 engine into the engine bay. Check out the playlist to see how we got to this point. We've actually come a very long way with this car already. I'm currently working towards the first start, and I've never seen this engine run, but all the signs are there that it will, and we're very close to finding out. The only thing between us and turning the key is the lack of the intake manifold and related components. But let's start with the why. As you can see, I've got the M52's original manifold just mocked onto the engine. It's just pushed onto the studs, not tightened on or anything like that. I've put it on just so I can get a visual on where things go, because I believe the last time this M52 engine ran, it actually ran with this exact M52 manifold. It's the one that came with the engine. It makes sense to look at this manifold before we start working on the M50 manifold to work out what the key differences are, because each difference is a new challenge to overcome with this, basically. The M50 manifold I have here is actually the sought after 2.5 litre version, not to be confused with the 2 litre version which can often catch people out. This 2.5 version is the only one worth swapping onto an M52 and they're getting quite expensive to buy now. You can confirm it's a 2.5 version in two ways actually. Firstly, these runners are much larger as opposed to the 2 litre version. And secondly, because you might not have two manifolds side by side, this one does say 2.5 on it. It's dead simple, let me show you that now. Right here, you can see 2.5 there. Comparing the M50 manifold to the M52 manifold, you can see there's a, a stark difference between the size of the runners. The M50 manifold is actually around 60% larger in runner size compared to the original M52 manifold. It's said that this intake on an M52 B28 is actually one of the main bottlenecks that limits the engine's peak performance and switching to the M50 intake can yield gains as high as 20 horsepower which is pretty remarkable for a bolt-on mod to a naturally aspirated engine. You might ask why BMW opted to strangle the M52 with the smaller intake when they could have just as easily fitted this M50 manifold from the factory and that's a very good question. Now from what I've read and feel free to comment on this if you possess knowledge on it, they use the smaller runner design for two good reasons. One, the smaller runners actually change the characteristics of this straight six engine to give it more low down torque. I'm not an engineer but I believe this is actually to do with the smaller runners increasing the velocity of the air through them at lower RPMs. A low end torque will make an engine feel nicer for everyday driving. It gives you that feeling of a bit more grunt. Point number two is emissions. And I think again, this relates to that low down grunt I just mentioned. As a daily driver, this engine will do better fuel economy at lower RPMs. You won't have to work the engine as hard day to day. And bear in mind, Although this M52 is now a prized engine for enthusiasts, it was originally selected by new car buyers who did not want the M-Power engines that came in the likes of the M3. These kind of people were not utilizing peak performance, but instead wanted to waft around town in comfort with the car's engine feeling completely unbothered. Due to the drop in low end torque we might see by fitting this M50 manifold, there's actually a fair few people who say upgrading to it is actually a folly and all things considered, you'll make no gain. Personally, I think this is a matter of taste. People have been doing this upgrade for years for a reason, and the majority of people, and their dyno sheets, agree that it clearly adds a lot of peak power with the correct engine map. In my particular case, as the E30 is a nice light chassis, and I'm building it to be a fun B-road blaster, I think I'm gonna find the M52 with this M50 manifold a more engaging drive and I shouldn't miss the low down torque too much. Bear in mind that I am actually an S54 fan, so I like the feeling of winding an engine up to the high RPMs to extract its performance. I want this E30 to have its peak power up top. I like the drama of it. If I wanted to have a car with gobs of effortless torque low down, I'd have picked an engine with a turbo on it. 
The only shame of this really is that I've not driven this car with the standard M52 manifold to get a real world comparison. But then again, I'm not gonna to rush to get rid of this. And when this car's on the road, I might even chuck this on just to experiment and see what the differences are. Okay, so now I've stated my intention of fitting the M50 manifold and I've given you my why. Let's talk about how. So I'm gonna pull this M52 manifold off, take it to the bench, and then we can look at the two side by side. As far as mods go, it's relatively straightforward this, but if you hoped it'd be as simple as just switching one component out for another, you'd unfortunately be wrong. This M50 manifold I've purchased in particular has been modified already, let me show you that now. Now a standard M50 manifold does not come with this plate attached to it with two large ports here and here. This actually matches what the M52 has. In fact, this plate that's screwed on, the black part, is from an M52, but this metal plate below it and either side of it is completely non-standard and aftermarket. The guy before me has basically chopped a window into this M50 manifold and fitted it with this metal part, basically converting it into an M52 one with all the same ports, takeoffs, and bracket that the M52 one has. Very kind of him to simplify this for me. This port is actually for the PCV, positive crankcase ventilation, and this port is actually for the ICV, the idle control valve. I will link to a kit to do this modification yourself if you're feeling brave, but whilst I'm here, I'll also explain quickly how you can use a standard M50 manifold, which is the more common way, because obviously you're gonna be reluctant to chop up such an expensive part. With a standard M50 manifold, you'll notice it has one large port here, which is basically a hose adapter. You can buy a custom hose kit to turn this into a T-piece, which will go to both the ICV and the PCV for an M52 engine. It's not as proper as what's been done here, but it's how most people do it, so I'll link to a kit to do that too. So that's these ports underneath explained, but we're not done with the challenges yet. The next problem is actually with the throttle body. Now, the M50's throttle body, and this one is an M52, is actually a similar design. I think you can use either, but most people, myself included, will want to use the original M52 throttle body. But there's a problem here. You'll notice that the M50 manifold has a seal on the manifold. The M52 man manifold has no seal on the manifold, and the M52's throttle body has a seal. And sadly, two seals don't make a seal. To get around that, I've got a kit from Creation Motorsport, which again, I'll link in the description. And we're gonna use this large plate to sandwich between the two seals. And that should mean we get a good seal. We'll fit this plate and the throttle body in situ because until then they'll only get in the way really. But you'll notice in the kit there was a few other things which I'll look at now. So this nice looking object is actually a block off for the M50's hose port, which we were just looking at on the underneath for if you're chopping it. We won't be using that, but it's a nice souvenir. Now, there are another two brackets in here as well, along with the uh, hardware, which seems good quality. And these two brackets actually solve our next problem. And that problem is with the fuel rail. This is the M52 fuel rail, which we're gonna use. And as you can see, these mounting points on the M50 manifold don't actually line up with it. So we can use these little brackets to adapt it. It does involve doing a little bit of a chop on this, which I'll get to later in the video, but should be a good solution. Before I go ahead and start trying to fit things up and attach things to this M50 manifold, let's go ahead and chuck it into the engine bay and test fit it. The eagle-eyed of you might have noticed that there's been some fin trimmage on here, which I've done myself actually already. I will explain why to you in just a moment when it's in the engine bay, you'll see. Now this booster is why I've trimmed the fins. 
Now, this is an E90 booster, you may have seen the previous video, so it's much slimmer line than the original E30's booster. If I was using an original E30 booster, there would be not a cat's chance of getting this manifold in. Even with the E90 booster, it's very, very tight with the M50 manifold, which is why I've taken precaution of trimming these fins. So now the M50 manifold's in place, I'm just trying to look at where everything goes and just kind of visualize how it's gonna be all together and work out what needs to go where. Now, there are brackets that come for these intake manifolds and there should be two of them. Unfortunately, I've only got one. Um, without them, I'm a bit worried that a lot of pressure is gonna get put on those studs into that aluminum head. So I am gonna mount this one and hopefully one will do the job. Looks like it's gonna go here lining up with the the custom metal part on the underside of the m50 manifold roughly roughly about there i'll need to figure that out for sure but i'm also noticing a couple of other issues one i was fully expecting which is this vacuum takeoff for the brake booster it just it just doesn't reach up to this port so i think i'm going to swap the larger line to a longer one that's just gonna raise this non-return valve up to, to meet with this, and that shouldn't be too big of a problem. But the big problem I've spotted, and I'm feeling a bit foolish over it, is this. Might have a little bit of trouble with the intake elbow, which is not what I was expecting really. I think having visualized this with the smaller M52 manifold before and without this on, I'd kind of, foolishly decided in my head that this isn't really in the way but now looking at it with this in place it absolutely 100% is in the way that won't do so that's a bit of an oversight so what I'm going to have to do is what you see most people doing when they do an M50 or an M52 swap which is moving the power steering reservoir location to the stock location if it was a, an E36 that's down here using this bracket. Sadly, I've already used the bolt hole on this engine arm to create an extra earth just to hedge my bets on the earth. So that work's kind of gonna have to be thrown away or modified, but I'll figure that out. Moving this shouldn't be such a big deal, despite the fact Dan at BM Conversions has made it for me with longer lines specifically to reach up here. Sorry for wasting your time with that, Dan, but I'm sure we're gonna make it work. Right, so now I need to deal with the unfortunate fact that I've actually topped this off with power steering fluid and it's gonna go bloody everywhere. So I've got a cunning plan. I need to spin the power steering pump to pull that fluid into the lines and then hopefully we're gonna spill a lot less of it. Let's see what we can do. So previously I said I'll top off the power steering fluid when the engine's running and spinning this pulley which will circulate the fluid. Now we haven't got that luxury unfortunately, so to pull some of the fluid into the lines and out of that top reservoir I'm going to spin this artificially and to do that I'm going to start by taking the tension off the belt, slipping it off just like that. I'm going to use an electric drill with a wobble head on it on one of the bolts on this pulley. Hey, we're in business here, I reckon. And it's only gone and bloody worked. Right, let's get it repositioned. Get the belt back on first.
a mess. Ah, anticlimactic. Good. How lucky is that? You can actually see the level in this line and we were just above it, so I've not made a mess. Let's hope I don't make a mess putting it onto the reservoir. Well, I was a bit frustrated to be having to revisit this. However, it's actually worked out really nicely. I've even got my earth back on in the right spot. So I'm quite happy with how it's come out. There's actually two happy accidents as a result of doing that as well. The first one is I'm noticing the ATF that's come out of it is actually quite cloudy. So it was probably did it a bit of good to give that a flush through. So I'll put fresh back in rather than pouring it back in, which is what I was originally planning. Secondly, some of the hose I've chopped off looks like it's about the right size for this uh, vacuum takeoff for the booster, so I'm going to try and use it for that, so all's well that ends well. That's the manifold support bracket on now, and actually, it's really firmed the whole thing up, taking in the pressure off those studs, which was what I was hoping. I think, to be honest, I'm gonna be fine to run it without the additional one, but let me know if you disagree in the comments. The bracket took a little bit of fiddling, and I spared you the details, but I had to give it a little bit of a bend somehow. It looked like somebody had previously bent it, but now I've bent it back, it's spot on. So with it in its final position, I'm now going to have a look at this vacuum takeoff that needs to connect to it to the brake booster to work out how much I need to extend it by. So I'm planning to replace the larger hose with a slightly longer one, probably the power steering line I've just chopped off, to lift up this one-way valve to make it meet this port here. So I'll get the tape measure and work out how long, how long of a hose I need. Let's do that now. Looks like I need to add six centimetres. There we go. So that's my brake booster vacuum line on and I'm pretty happy with how that's come together. Also still quite happy with the bracket that supports the manifold, so that's good. So the next thing to do now is take this all back off, take the manifold to the bench and have a look at how the ICV and the PCV mounts underneath it, which need to be done before it's put on the car really. Now, whilst this manifold's back off, 
that might be my opportunity to then figure out where the throttle cable roots. I'm not really sure where it goes right now. It must be around the back of the engine or something similar to that. But anyway, we'll figure that out in a minute. For starters, let's assemble this M50 manifold. So let's start with the ICV, which is this. It's the idle control valve. To check that yours is good, give it a shake and it should make that noise. Now this one was actually quite gummed up when I received it. I bought it from a breaker. So I had to put some brake clean in it and shake it around a bit and I've been putting some power to it, just check it works. Now it does work, which I'm pleased about. Now the hose has a bit of a split in it, so I'm gonna have to come back to that. But for now, I'm gonna fit it up and see how we go. So it mounts on here. So there's a big rubber bung on this side of it, which pushes into this big port here. And the bracket has two staggered bolts and the holes are staggered too. So it's definitely the right spot. So now we can look at the PCV valve. Now this quite simply goes onto this port here. It needs another one of those big rubber things. So I could harvest it off there like this. I'll push it onto there. Three bolts on the bracket, holds it in place. And this connects on to the top of the rocker cover to vent it. This positive crankcase ventilation system actually relieves the pressure in the crankcase created by the pistons descending down in the stroke out of the rocker cover, down this tube and into this, which is an oil air separator. The air goes through the top back into the intake and the oil pulls at the bottom and runs down this tube, which should connect to the dipstick. Now, because I'm using an E34 sump with an E34 dipstick. I don't have the little fork on the dipstick tube that this would connect to, unfortunately. Obviously this rubber hose is much longer and it's actually snapped off. But that's a problem we're gonna come to shortly. For now, let's attach the PCV to the manifold and move forward from there. I've actually got a new one of these because this one looks absolutely mullered and the tube is split. It ended up not being too expensive so I just went for the full thing. Let's get that on now. So now the PCV is mounted and I'm happy with it, I'm going to have a look at the vacuum ports on this manifold. Now there are two very small ones and one larger one, the same as on the M52 manifold because it's been converted to M52 manifold style. So now what I can do is look at the M52 manifold and work out where these actually went to because kindly the previous owners left them in place for me. From my research online I'm actually coming away a little bit unclear about exactly what these breather lines are for and I think they vary quite a bit on different cars in different markets. Uh, from my understanding though, one of these smaller lines actually goes to a, a T-piece that feeds a secondary air pump system which my car's not going to have so I'll probably want to cap this one off. The other small line 
feeds the fuel pressure regulator, which is on the end of the fuel rail, which you can see here, and you can see the port for it there. The larger one, which the previous owner seems to have just capped off with a bolt, I'm pretty sure is for the fuel tank breather. On an E36, I think this is what it would look like, and it would have a valve with a connector on it that opens and closes it. I don't think I need this, so I'm planning to just hook hook this line directly up to the breather that's on the E30 system and hope for the best. But as I say, do comment if you know better than I on this. And for good measure, I'm going to change all of these intake manifold gaskets for new ones. Apparently this is something that's often overlooked and these get squished with time and you end up where they don't seal properly. And when they don't seal properly, it's effectively like a vacuum leak and the engine doesn't run right. So it makes sense to stick these on now and just forget about it. Right, that took a few minutes off camera to get that back on actually, because it turns out the PCV valve clashes with the spider pipe, which wasn't obvious until I was having a closer look at it. So I had to loosen that off a bit to, to work it around. Now it's on properly. But yeah, it turns out that you're not just gonna be putting it on and off really easy this, which is worth bearing in mind. So the next thing I'm gonna do is tighten that PCV back on, connect the vacuum lines up and the electrical connectors, and then after that, I should be brave enough to put the nuts on the studs, because what I don't want to do is rush to put those on and find out I have to take the whole thing off again. So now I've got my ICV plugged in and everything arranged underneath the manifold reasonably well. I'm now gonna put my M7 nuts on the studs. So I've got the studs torqued up to 15 newton meters, which is around 11 foot pounds. And I've also tightened up the support bracket. And now it's on really solid shape, the whole car from it. So I'm quite happy with that. The next thing I want to do is have a look at the fuel rail and how it's going to connect to the E30 fuel lines, which are in place. Now, the guy before me did me a favor by chopping the ends off these two lines instead of just destroying them entirely. So. I think we need to be fed around the side and I'm going to use two brass adapters which I have here to hopefully connect these lines to the E30 ones cutting them down to size so there's not loads of slack. Now looking now I've got a bad feeling I'm about to be taking this manifold back off that I've just talked up 
but let's have a closer look and try and figure this out. So with the fuel lines now fed through, and they look about the right length after all, I'm just looking at how this fuel rail actually mounts to the intake manifold. So unfortunately, the towers that where the fuel rail mounts for an M50 aren't quite in the same spot as an M52, so this M52 fuel rail doesn't quite fit. However, in that kit, the Creation Motorsports kit I showed you earlier, there are these little adapters which go between the towers on the manifold and the holes on the fuel rail. These adapters will correct the offset of the screws, but there's another problem, unfortunately. This fuel rail, the, the way these tabs are designed, means it clashes with the towers, so you can never actually get them lined up correctly. So what I need to do is trim off a bit of the metal so that it will butt up nicely and sit, sit in the correct place with these towers here. So I'm going to have to pull this back out, trim it with an angle grinder just here on both sides, and then hopefully we can put it back on with our adapters and it'll fit perfect. I also think I'm going to remove this plastic tray that the wiring cowl clips onto because I'm really struggling with the position of the wiring. It wants to occupy the same space as the fuel pressure regulator, which is quite annoying. So I think with that out of the way, I'll be able to figure this out more. I might even have to trim some of this, but we can figure that out.
that's the six injectors in now and the two lambda sensors are plugged in. Quite happy with how it's going so far. Next thing to do is to rig up the Bowden cable, aka the throttle cable. Now this that I have here is the original Bowden cable from the M40 engine and it's damaged at one end, but that's not such a big deal because I'm not going to use it. For an M52 swap in an E30, you need a very specific throttle cable. It's an E34 one from an M50 engine. So this is the E34 M50 throttle cable and it's on part number 35411160611 and I believe there's actually two lengths of throttle cable that are under the same part number. Now there's a short one which is 635mm and there's a long one which this one is which is 1170mm. You do need the long one for this swap. Annoyingly, it's not actually listed in lengths, only in part number, in any listing that I found for it. So I ended up taking a punt on this one on eBay, which turned out to be a genuine part, the correct one. So I'll link this one, the exact listing, in the description, so you can get the same correct one too. Hopefully that's helpful. So let's get it fitted up. And this 90 degree end actually is the end that goes into the firewall. There's a, a square clip that pushes into the square hole which allows the, the, this end to go into the driver's footwell and attach to the throttle linkage. And this end obviously wants to go to where the throttle body is going to be. Not certain how it routes actually around the engine, I imagine around the back somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clip this end in now and then we'll see where it wants to sit on this end. So let's crack on. Right, with that throttle cable now roughly in place, I can fit the throttle body with the adapter plate I showed you earlier. So the next job is to fit this oil dipstick tube into the sump. There's a hole in the top of the sump and it just pushes in with this o-ring. This is a customised dipstick. The bottom has been chopped off it. It's been chopped off it because it's the one that came with my modified E34 sump, which is shallower and had a, a side portion welded onto it just to keep the capacity the same in theory. So I'm going to push this in and there's two things to note here. That's that because this is front sumped M52 now and not rear sumped, we will need to fashion some kind of bracket, probably from here, to connect to this, to secure it at the top and keep it in place. But in the interest of starting the car today, it's well, seeing if it'll start, I'm going to just leave the top end loose and push the bottom end in, which should be fine. Another thing to note when using an E34 M50 dipstick with the M52 engine is the PCV valve that we mounted underneath the manifold the tube that, where the oil drains out the bottom should actually connect to a port on, on this. On, on an M52 original dipstick tube, you'll see there's a, an extra port that comes off where you'd attach the hose to. We don't have that. If I'm doing this properly, I will weld one onto here at some point, but again, 
that's to worry about another day in the interest of seeing if the car will start. So I'm just going to run with what I've got for now. Well, that's as, as in as it'll go, and it's a bit looser than I was expecting, actually. But the main thing I'm noticing is how high this dipstick is. It's the highest thing in the engine bay right now. So, knowing that, I'm starting to doubt that the actual dipstick is even going to touch into the oil, which is a bit worrying, to be honest, because I do want a way of knowing whether I've got the correct amount of oil in the car or not. My current plan is to start by pouring the correct 6.5 litres of oil into the engine, see if it reads onto the stick and if it does use that as my correct level but if it doesn't touch into the oil i'll have to come up with a, a different plan on another day maybe shortening this tube somehow but not for today now before i start trying to fit on the intake elbow and the math and the filter and all of that i'm going to fit on this particularly annoying pipe this is actually the pipe that goes between the icv and the intake elbow now these are notorious for being a problem and they split and when they do split you end up with a car that has a really bad idle that won't idle quite often and they really do split easily. This one was actually split at both ends. When I spotted there were £100 to replace I decided that I was going to try and glue this one for now just so that I can see if the car will start and idle and I think I'll have to come up with some custom solution in the future but the gluing seems to have gone quite well so it might even last a little while, we'll see. But let's stick this on now while we've got access. We're getting pretty close to turning the key now. I'm just having a look at the, the MAF, the intake elbow and the filter. These were the things that came with this engine, so I believe the last time this car, this engine ran was with this stuff fitted. You'll notice there's another throttle body here, a smaller one that's electronically controlled. This one is actually part of the traction control system that an M52 car would have had. Effectively, when the, when the computer detects slip, it will close this butterfly valve, shutting the throttle independently of what your feet are doing. Now, I'm not planning to run any traction control or anything like this on this E30 build. So to me, this is just an obstruction to the intake that I want rid of. So to get shot of this, I've actually picked up an alternative intake elbow. This elbow is just a, a cheap aftermarket one off eBay, surprisingly cheap actually. I'll also link to it, it seems decent quality. It's the style of an earlier M50 equipped car that didn't have traction control or anything like that. So I should be able to fit this on in place of this butterfly valve and this like half elbow and then it should fit up perfect. You'll notice on this new elbow there's actually two ports whereas the M52 elbow only has one. So I'll need to block one of these up. The other port I'm going to use for that annoying ICV pipe. Okay, so let's find something to block off that extra port with and get this elbow fitted and the intake. That's the math plugged in and the intake air temperature sensor plugged in too. Now, this intake is actually horrific, so don't worry, I'm not planning to run with this long term. It's just to see if it'll start. 
I'm going to replace this with something much more sensible, preferably something that's not actually a hot air intake, which is effectively what this one is. So before I get ahead of myself and start trying to crank this car, I need to put oil in it. So as mentioned earlier, I'm going to put the 6.5 litres straight into it. No idea if we're going to get a reading, we'll find out. But once I've done that, we can actually see if it'll fire up. So let's chuck the oil in now. So I picked up this cheap 10W40 semi-synthetic stuff. I'm just going with cheap stuff for now because I'm going to effectively use this as an engine flush. I think it's probably wise to do a, a couple of short order oil changes on this engine because it hasn't run for quite a long time. So once I've determined that it does run, we'll probably drop this and put something higher quality in it. But it'll be good to find out if it starts. I've also got my redneck um, funnel, which I'm going to use now. Nailed it. Out of interest, let's just have a look and see if we've got an oil level reading on this dipstick. Now we have, it's below min, oops, just onto the flat section there. But we haven't filled up the oil filter yet, so we'll have another look at that after we've turned it over a bit. Okay, so short of adding petrol, the only other thing I can think of is the ECU. If you remember back to when we did the M52 wiring video, the car was actually, at the end of that video, cranking quite well on the key with this ECU plugged in. Now, this ECU is it's an MS41, but it's not index 10 or index 11, which from my understanding means it's not at all editable. So I was expecting it to still have EWS enabled. Somebody enlightened me in the comments of that video and said that the EWS doesn't actually prevent the car from cranking, it only prevents it from sparking. So it cranking on the key with that uneditable ECU isn't actually unusual. Since then, I've picked up this. This is an MS41 ECU that is editable and you can see it says index 11 there. Now, and this one has actually been pre-mapped for a car just like this. I'll quickly run down the specs for you now. It's had EWS removed from it. It's had speed limiter delete, speed signal delete for no ABS and this car doesn't have ABS. 7,000 RPM raised red line, 900 RPM idle, which should help with a light and solid flywheel like this car has. And it's also been mapped for the M50 inlet and dynoed on a similar car to this to 227 brake horsepower. Obviously, take the horsepower number with a pinch of salt. There's no way it will make that with that janky hot air intake. Maybe at some point I will get this car dynoed and actually get the map tweaked to suit this build specifically, but again, down the line. So what I'm planning to do is I'm going to leave that ECU in place, crank the car a bit just to prime the fuel and all of that kind of thing. And also it'll confirm to me that the EWS is not removed from that. Then I'll swap this on and hopefully it'll burst into life. Hopefully I've not just given it the kiss of death by saying that. But what I need to do is stop blabbering. I'll pour some petrol in and we'll actually find out. So it's 10 litres of Tesco's finest 99 octane, the 
tank is completely dry, so hopefully that's more than enough for it to actually feed the uh, feed the engine. Sorry for building the suspense so much, but it's actually the next morning. So before I started cranking the key yesterday evening, I decided to come round the front of the car and do some checks, at which point I noticed the glaringly unoccupied plug at the end of this injector wiring rail, and I knew something just definitely wasn't right. With it being so late in the day, I decided to down tools and go and do a bit of research and come back with some fresh eyes. Uh, we also have the added benefit today of the wisdom of the old man which tends to come in quite handy. So from my research it's the Vanos solenoid that should actually plug into this connector on, on the end of the injector wiring and the thing that I have plugged into the Vanos solenoid is actually for the intake air temperature which is under the manifold here. The thing I've plugged into the intake air temperature sensor is actually supposed to be plugged into this fuel breather which I have left out. I think I'm going to continue leaving that out and just let that dangle. So once I've played musical chairs with these connectors, and they're all the same type, which is why it was not obvious to me, after that, I think we're ready to crank. So let's do the job. second thoughts, I am just going to plug in this uh, fuel breather purge valve into its correct plug, just in case it upsets the ECU. Now there may be other electrical issues that we're actually not aware of yet, but this is as good as we can do for now. And there appear to be no immediate fuel or oil leaks, which is good news. Let's connect that battery and put ourselves out of our misery, shall we? Here we go. Fuel's shooting up, nearly quarter of a tank, 10 litres. Coolant temperature's twitching, which is strange. Maybe I've got a, a bad earth. So I think this is the bleeder for the fuel rail, so I think we'll know absolutely nothing. I think we need to make sure that the fuel pump is actually pumping fuel through, so we'll have to have a quick look at that. Good plan. Now we know the fuel pump on an E30 does not prime. It only pumps when the car is cranking. So we're gonna crank it and see if we can hear for this pumping. And if we hear nothing, what we might do is switch the ECUs out and see if EWS also stops fuel pumping. Not really sure about that. Right, give it a crank. Pure silence. Pure silence, pumping that. Hmm. Right, battery unhooked. Let's rule out EWS as a reason why the fuel pump is not pumping. I never do get those in first time. Give it another crank. nothing again. So we've been fiddling around with this for a while now and it seems like we cannot get this fuel pump to pump on the key for whatever reason. 
but if we put direct power to it it works fine so the fuel pump is working we must have another wiring issue going on also the room starting to smell with a very strong scent of petrol and there's a puddle growing underneath the engine so I've definitely got an issue I need to sort out there as well and investigate as this video really is supposed to be about fitting an M50 manifold I think I'm going to can it here I know it's a bit anticlimactic and I'm sorry about that but stay tuned and I'm hoping in the next video I am actually going to get this car to run or at least cough into life a little bit so make sure you subscribe for that I do hope the information I've given you about the M50 manifold has been useful I am confident the car's going to run with the manifold even though you haven't seen it in this video so if that's been helpful to you please make sure you give us a like thank you very much for watching